Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. I think we'll, we'll get started. Uh, well, welcome uh, to the third in our inaugural Digital Humanities Speaker Series, Empowering the Humanities, sponsored by our department, the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, and uh, generously supported by the chair of the Wentworth Board of Trustees, Michael Anthony. Um, for those of you who have been with us since the, the beginning of the series, um, we opened the series back in January with Professor John Unsworth from, from Brandeis University, where we were given uh, more of an historical overview of how the digital environment is changing the landscape of higher education in general and the humanities and social sciences in particular and a, a general sense of where this thing called digital humanities came from and where it's going. We followed this up uh, just last month with Professor Catherine Tomaszek, uh, Associate Professor of History at Wheaton College and co-director of the Digital History Project, who, if you remember, gave us uh, quite a fascinating and engaging um, and energetic uh, look at how she and her undergraduate history students are using digital tools in the classroom for close readings of uh, primary source documents. Um, before I introduce uh, tonight's speaker, I do want to remind everyone to save the date for the last talk uh, in our series. On Tuesday, April 2nd, same place, same, same time, um, our guest speaker will be George Fifield, a new media curator and professor of new media at RISD and founding director of Boston Cyber Arts. So we'll be taking a different direction for the last in our series and looking more at, at uh, uh, digital uh, visual media. Uh, we're very fortunate to have with us this evening Ryan Cordell, uh, assistant professor of English, contributor at, uh, across the street at Northeastern, uh, contributor to the Prof Hacker blog in the Chronicle of Higher Education and self-described digital Americanist. Uh, Dr. Cordell received his PhD uh, in English Language and Literature from the University of Virginia. He currently holds an Andrew W. Mellon Fellowship of Scholars in Critical uh, Biography. He's published widely in his field, including most recently co-authoring the textbook Writing About Literature Through Critical Theory uh, by uh, flat, word, flat World Knowledge and uh, in forthcoming special issue on the Literary and Digital Humanities Quarterly, an article entitled Taken Possession of Hawthorne's Celestial Railroad in 19th Century uh, Ev Evangelical Canon. Uh, he was recently featured in the Atlantic magazine as uh, in an article entitled The Viral Media Prof Whose Kids Got One Million uh, Facebook Likes and a Puppy, um, and appeared as a result of that with his whole family uh, on Good Morning America not that long ago. And I just learned tonight that they've, the family has been, um, uh, got a contract to, to write a children's book on this whole episode. <laughs> so it just keeps coming. Um, the title of his talk tonight is Mapping the Networks of Viral Texts in 19th Century America. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ryan Cordell. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to, to Wentworth for, for having me. I'm, I'm excited to, to talk about this work. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, Sarah Sage at Southern Methodist University who put together this lovely uh, image uh, for a talk that I gave down there and I've just sort of stolen it and been using it for all the talks I've been giving because I like it so much. Um, I wanted to encourage you, if you are someone who's on Twitter, feel free to tweet this talk. That's my, that's my username. So uh, if you are so inclined, feel free. So what I want to talk about today is my, my primary research project and what I told uh, Ron I was going to do was to try and illustrate with this how a pretty traditional humanities research project uh, can open up to include new tools, um, new approaches, and new collaborators, and the kinds of payoffs that can come from that. And so, uh, yeah, so let me just dive right in. 
So most broadly, my work uh, is concerned with the convergence of religion and print culture and technology during the mid-19th century. And th this is a, a print by Courier and Ives that, I, that illustrates a lot of my concerns pretty well. You've got all of these innovations, the, the railroad, the steam press, the telegraph, all of these things that were reshaping the way that uh, Americans, well not just Americans, but the way that people communicated with one another and were in many ways compressing time and space and allowing communication to happen much more quickly and new forms of communication to uh, come into being. I like the, the ticker tape that's coming out of the, the telegraph here because it illustrates how tied up some of these uh, technological advances were with religious uh, impulses in the United States. You see it says, liberty and union now and forever, one and inseparable, the kind of political message, and glory to God in the highest on earth, peace and goodwill toward men, the Annunciation, right? So these two millennial ideas and political ideas all kind of tied up in the technology of the day. So John Walsh has observed that for the, sorry, I want to start here. John Walsh has observed that for the 19th century, it holds a special attraction for digital literary scholarship because the age so closely parallels our own. The industrial revolution, he claims, is the closest analog to the rapid technological and social change of the digital era. The new mass media produced more information than could be processed through traditional means such as reading. And so in some ways modern information overload begins in the 19th century, although I, I think everyone thinks it begins in the century that they study, but I'm going to say it begins in the 19th century. Uh, with modern humanities technologies though, this overload can be an asset to scholarship rather than a liability. So I'm going to start small with a chance discovery made in an obscure archive and show how that discovery opened for me questions that are familiar to literary scholars and led through the assistance of textual, geospatial, and network analysis technologies to new kinds of questions that I think can enhance our understanding of the United States before the Civil War. So this is where all this starts, actually. I, I, was, in, I was in an archive, a little tiny archive in a very small town in Michigan. I was doing research for my dissertation that had nothing at all to do with Nathaniel Hawthorne. And I came across this little uh, blurb where the editors of this, so I was looking at this newspaper called The, the um, Midnight Cry. And The Midnight Cry was published by a group of people called the Adventists who believed that the world was going to end in 1843. And they had a lot of good reasons for thinking so, lots of evidence that they had accumulated. And the, the newspapers that I was looking, I was interested in apocalyptic rhetoric. That, that was what was bringing me to this archive. And these newspapers, for the most part, printed proofs that the world was going to end. They had exegesis of biblical passages, current events that they thought signified that the world was coming to an end, and things like that. And in the midst of all of that, I came across this uh, reprinting of a Nathaniel Hawthorne short story called The Celestial Railroad. And I was surprised to find this because this newspaper printed almost nothing that we would call literary. They didn't print any stories, they didn't print any poetry, and most newspapers in the 19th century did. They printed fiction, they printed poetry, they printed all kinds of things that we wouldn't find in a modern newspaper. And uh, so I was very curious. I was very curious why this particular story was in this newspaper. This is the whole newspaper and you can see over there the Celestial Railroad by Nathaniel Hawthorne. I was very curious, what's going on here? I turned to another volume that I had close at hand. This was the Signs of the Times, published here in Boston. It was another newspaper by the same group. Uh, the Midnight Cry published in New York, the Signs of the Times published in Boston, and I found Hawthorne's story here too. So I was very curious about what was going on. Meredith McGill, who is a prominent scholar of 19th century America, says if you're curious about Nathaniel Hawthorne, the, the best information available is uh, C.E. Fraser Clark Jr.'s invaluable Nathaniel Hawthorne, a descriptive bibliography. And she says, while not a comprehensive list of the reprinting of Hawthorne's tales, a bibliographic feat which is as yet impossible due to the inadequately indexed state of 19th century periodicals, Clark's volume represents the best information available. So I turned to Clark's volume. Uh, don't worry that you can't read this. This is more of a visual than anything. But this is what I found. He had this many reprintings of the Celestial Railroad listed. And what struck me immediately when I went to that volume is that the one that I had to found was not here. 
right? The one reprinting I had seen is not listed. And so this, this prompted me to want to dig a little bit further. And so where I turned were the digital archives that are now available of 19th century newspapers and periodicals. And there are lots of these. Uh, newspapers, magazines, uh, literary magazines, books. You know, you've used Google Books. Like, that's one of them, right? Um, and I started searching. I started just, this is just simple search for key phrases from that story that I thought might be unique and might help me find more reprintings. And in only a few weeks, I'd found that many which is a little more than double the number that Clark listed in his bibliography, right? And, and again, this is the work of just really a, a couple of weeks at most. Beyond just the reprintings, I found hundreds and hundreds of references to the story, sermons that talked about the story, reviews of the story, um, other, kinds of, uh, other kinds of what we call paratexts that in some way were about the story or commenting on the story. In other words, what I was figuring out is that the Celestial Railroad was an incredibly popular text. And actually, after a little bit more research, I'm, I'm almost willing to say it was probably the most popular thing that Hawthorne wrote during his lifetime. But it's not something that we study very much today. So Meredith McGill r argues that the antebellum American experience of text was shaped by the widespread normative practice of reprinting in reprinting stories and poems, usually without authorial permission in newspapers and media. Right? This is before modern copyright law. So if I was, a, if I was an editor in, say, St. Louis, then what I would do is I would subscribe to newspapers all over the country. I would subscribe to newspapers in Boston and New York and, and uh, Cincinnati. And when they came in, I, I sometimes actually would employ someone whose entire job was to comb through those and find things that I thought my readers might like. And if they found anything, they would simply take it and I would reprint it. I wouldn't pay the author. Sometimes I would change the title. Sometimes I would remove the author's name, right? And this was, there was really no legal sanction against this. So it was a widespread practice. Reprinting, McGill argues, is a form of textual production that is inseparable from distribution and reception. Reprinted texts call attention to the repeated acts of articulation by which culture and its audiences are constituted. My experience in these digital archives, though, did lead me to question one of McGill's working assumptions, which is that the best information available about 19th century print culture is still the bibliographies like that of Clark's. And I began to wonder how we might begin uncovering and representing more comprehensive pictures of textual exchange, amendment, response, and what Leslie Thorne Murphy calls reauthorship. Thorne Murphy notes that we would be well served to develop strategies that allow us to piece together aspects of authorship, editing, and co-authorship that shaped these texts. So for me, all of these things, authorship, re-authorship, editing, sharing, add up to something that I've begun to call viral textuality, borrowing a more recent term that describes not simply reprinting, but larger ecosystems of reading and sharing and reprinting and reaction and appropriation and remixing. As a descriptor, viral describes the impact of text, however you want to delineate the word text, as signals of larger cultural and technological systems. So what do I mean by virality? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shamelessly exploit my kids to talk about what I mean by virality. So this is the, the, the picture that Ron was referring to earlier. These are my kids. Hi world, we want a puppy. Our dad said we could get one if we get one million likes. So like this, uh, P.S. he doesn't think we could do it. Uh, if you guys saw this, if you happen to like it, you'll know that they got to a million likes in about uh, seven hours, um, <laughs> which was surprising to dad. So what do I mean by viral? Uh, the first thing I mean is something that's widely shared, right? Maybe not uh, 1.7 million shares, but widely shared. And I mean something that has a kind of cultural resonance. It either taps into uh, a cultural uh, uh, idea that's already out there, or it starts a cultural idea that, that others uh, build on. So this idea of the 1 million Facebook likes plea uh, has become enough of a thing that you can find it on knowyourmeme.com. Right? And then it's something that is remixed or remade. And there's been plenty of that in the weeks since, uh, since the girls put their puppy plea online. So if we think historically, though, viral texts can tell us quite a bit about antebellum readers and editors. 
and they can help us to understand the larger social, political, and technological context that shape print culture. So I'm going to illustrate what I mean through five points, uh, each of which addresses textual virality at a different level, from the single text read very closely to an entire corpus read at a distance. So the first thing that I found is that viral text can point to the priorities, concerns, and interests of readers and editors. Uh, these texts, whether they're news stories or short fiction or poetry, are much more than historical curiosities. Uh, the texts that editors chose to pass on are useful barometers about what readers cared about. The history of the Celestial Railroad, for instance, reveals the central influence of evangelical editors and readers in shaping antebellum print culture. Denominational papers lauded the story's rich stores of instruction, the moral that it teaches, its admirable commentary, while being, quote, repeatedly solicited to republish it by their readers. It was a startling, impressive little work worthy to be a sequel to Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress and a remarkable satire on worldly religion. Most tellingly, the characters and the scenes from the Celestial Railroad become so familiar in antebellum print culture that they can be referred to without any context. So there's a character called Mr. Smooth It Away, and what you find is sermons where Mr. Smooth It Away is just sort of invoked without, any, without saying, you know, that guy from Hawthorne Celestial Railroad, because the, the preacher could just assume that everyone listening to him knew who this guy was, right? That's how ubiquitous this becomes. So, uh, one thing that we find is that as the story passed around the country, it was edited pretty heavily, especially in religious newspapers. Uh, I've used this software called Juxta, which is a kind of, is a version comparison, uh, it's version comparison. So you put in different text files and it actually visualizes the difference between them. Uh, the way it's projecting, you can't see the lines between quite so well, but it points out all the differences, right? And so you have denominations, for instance, taking out things that don't fit with their own religious beliefs. You have people adding in texts that make it more amenable to their readers. Uh, Juxta will also tell you precisely how much of two versions is, uh, has changed. And in the most dramatic, uh, the most dramatic uh, difference, which is the one you're seeing here, Juxta says that 79% of the text is not Hawthorne's. Right? That's how much they've changed it. But they keep Hawthorne's name on it and they keep the title, right? which, I find, which I find interesting. Here, this is that same version that was so dramatically edited and they actually print this little sort of coda in the, on the inside cover of the pamphlet, uh, basically apologizing for how much has been changed. Right? Um, we're indebted to Mr. Hawthorne for the idea but uh, a few verbal alterations have been made. The rest is not from Mr. Hawthorne's pen and may contain sentiments that he would not be willing to endorse. And I've actually found some evidence that Hawthorne was very uncomfortable with the way that religious readers and editors appropriated his story uh, for their own purposes. Here, the National Intelligencer is talking about this. They're talking about the way that people were employed. So the story, uh, just really briefly, it's a, it's a modern rewriting of Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress where modern improvements have been introduced into the pilgrimage route. So there's a train that you can get on that goes to the celestial city. You don't have to walk anymore. Um, you don't have to discard your burden of sins at the cross because you can put it in the baggage car to get at the end of the trip. Um, but of course, all of these modern conveniences are all a ruse uh, that it leads not to the celestial city, not to paradise, but to, to hell at the end, right? And so it's this satire of sort of modern religion that's too easy. Um, what I found is that the way that different religions interpreted this story is that they interpreted themselves as the good old-fashioned pilgrims who are doing it the right way, and they interpreted other religions as the ones who are making all of these terrible uh, modern modernizations of the faith, right? And so you have the story would get printed with a, with a preface that was sort of aiming it at someone else, right? Like, we're doing great, but those Presbyterians across the way, they're really messing things up, right? And so here, the Celestial Railroad had a wide popularity because while, as we have seen, the idea corresponded to prevalent suggestions in many minds, it was so general that it did not take sides for or against any sect and could be freely used by every sect against the rest. It was therefore eagerly printed in all church newspapers, banner casting it at herald, advocate at independent, inquirer at recorder, and etc. Right? So the, the text becomes this uh, weapon that you can use uh, in these, these debates. 
And this is actually an example of that. The Signs of the Times, again, published in Boston. The Cambridge Palladium published across the river in Cambridge. And basically what these two introductions are saying is, uh, the Signs of the Times is saying, look, everyone who doesn't agree with us, they really should read this because it's going to show them the truth. And the Cambridge Palladium is saying, the article was original, was been copied by Brother Himes. Brother Himes is the editor of the Signs over here. Wonder if that last mentioned brother, if he should look closely, would not see his own face reflected in the looking glass somewhere, right? So these two are just sort of throwing it at each other. So I'm building an edition of all this at this website here, celestiaurora.org, that's going to allow scholars to actually compare the different editions of the story and see the kinds of changes that were made. And uh, the paper that Ron mentioned is coming out literally within weeks in Digital Humanities Quarterly. So if you're curious about this particular story, uh, you can follow up and read more about it very soon. But what I want to do now is I want to think about how texts like this, like this one, can point to larger systems of viral textuality. The rapid distribution and response to a story like the Celestial Railroad was enabled by social, technological, professional, political, and religious networks. And I, I noted this before, but uh, Ellen Gruber Garvey talks about large papers actually employing someone whose entire job was to comb through these papers and find things to reprint, which, which points to a, a real investment of capital, actually, in this, in this system of reprinting. And this is perhaps what Hawthorne referred to in this letter where he talked about the pamphlet and piratical system, which had broken up all regular literature. In this letter, he's, he's complaining about the fact that the Celestial Railroad is so popular, but he's not getting any money for it, right? It's getting reprinted, people are talking about it, but he's not getting any money for it. And he's very upset. Uh, his wife, Sophia, writes that there was no authority from the power that is publishing the Celestial Railroad. Nathaniel was quite surprised to be taken possession of so unceremoniously. So most studies of reprinted texts look a lot like my work. I'm going to skip through that look a lot like my work on the Celestial Railroad. They focus on a single text, and they unpack its history to make an argument about its cultural meaning and ramifications. And such an intense focus largely springs from practical limitations. Uh, the sheer volume of printed material produced during the 19th century makes it very difficult for modern scholars to find the vast majority of reprinted texts. Most archives of 19th century books and periodicals provide only the most basic discovery tools you can browse through a particular periodical or microfilm hoping to find something, but that could take a lifetime if you really wanted to do it right. Digital archives are somewhat more amenable to discovery because you can search, right? You can go there and you can put in keywords. But there's a problem with that, which is that you have to know what keywords to put in to find anything, which is to say we know that there's a huge system of reprinting, but the only text that you can find in a search bar are the ones that you already know are there, right? You have to already have a clue that it's there in order to know what to search for. So how do we address this? Sorry, I'm take a drink. So an additional problem is that the OCR, the optical character recognition in these archives is often quite poor. Right? They usually haven't been edited. Someone has sort of scanned them in, automatically tried to recognize all the text. But what's there is, is pretty bad. And you're going to see an example of that in a second. So this is an additional challenge. I argue that these kinds of limitations tend to reinforce our existing suppositions about the period. While leaving undiscovered popular texts that may be precisely what we have failed to understand about popular opinion, reading habits, or public debate. Since arriving with, at Northeastern, I've begun to collaborate with a colleague in computer science, David Smith, to try and address this uh, issue. And, and I'm going to fly through a couple of, these are David's slides that I have stolen. And I'm going to have to do a little bit of hand waving to assure you that the algorithm works <laughs> uh, without going into the gory details of the algorithm that we're using. But I'm, I'm, I want to explain the, the innovation that he's brought to the project and then talk about its ramifications. So David is very interested in duplicate detection. And, and his goals here are slightly different than mine. He's, he's interested in duplicate detection as it applies to, um, for instance, plagiarism detection right, on, on the web, and even has some applications for him in translation uh, issues. And we can talk more about that if, if folks are interested. The challenges with looking at something like a newspaper is that we have, again, dirty OCR. Often the text that we're looking for, the matches, fall in different places in the newspaper. The columns are different widths. There are all kinds of alignment problems. And um, 
So here's what he's, he's been doing. We grabbed all of the data from Chronicling America. We've been using Chronicling America, which is the Library of Congress's archive of uh, newspapers and magazines. Mo I'm sorry, just newspapers. We grabbed all of the textual data uh, and we're focusing on before the Civil War. And we, the reason we're looking at before the Civil War is it's before the birth of wire services. If you're looking at textual reuse, the wire service changes things dramatically because people can do exact duplication through the wire. And the entire archive gets broken down into five grams, sequences of five words. And the algorithm scans each page and compares all the five grams on each page with all of the other five grams in the entire database. And if it finds enough matching five grams between two pages, then it spits it out as a likely reprint. Okay? There are some other kind of processing pri pipelines here. Um, for instance, ignore pairs from the same newspaper. This was something that we added to, to filter out ads because you get a lot of advertisements, you know, that repeat day after day in the newspaper and we, we weren't interested in ads, another scholar might be. And this is what you get back. You can see how terrible the OCR is, right? But these are matching texts from four different newspapers and this is actually a temperance story, a story arguing against uh, consumption of alcohol that circulated around the country. It was by T.S. Arthur, who's a fairly well-known temperance writer from the 19th century. The really uh, exciting thing here is that we're finding reprints. As you'll note, these don't look exactly the same, right? All that has to happen is there have to be enough matching five grams. But this actually adjusts really quite well for the po poor OCR because not the entire text does not have to match. Only en uh, enough of it has to match. And it doesn't have to be in sequence what matches. It just has to be five gram here, or five gram there. So it, it allows us to work around the poor OCR and it's been quite successful. Um, in our initial study, we found enough that it made sense to have a, a spreadsheet that said top 5,000. And actually we found something around 55,000 reprinted texts in this one archive of 19th century newspapers. The vast majority of these reprints, as I've looked through them, are texts that, to my knowledge, literary scholars have really not talked about in the past. They're, they're, they're new. Um, and this is, for me, really exciting. But then the question becomes, not sure why my computer is being so slow today. But, um, then the question becomes, what can we actually do with 50,000 reprinted texts? Like, what, it's impossible for me to actually read 50,000 texts. So what are we going to do with them? And so I've started thinking about the ways that mapping uh, with GIS might help give us a purchase on these texts. GIS or Global Information Systems and other geospatial software can offer compelling possibilities for working meaningfully with texts at such a scale. We can correlate print histories with spatial data. Viral texts can be mapped and compared to analyze their spread across the country and to start to build models of 19th century readership. Uh, in his introduction to the Placing History volume, Richard White claims that relationships that jump out when presented in spatial form, such as a map, tend to clog a narrative, choking its arteries until even if the narrative does not expire, the reader, overwhelmed by detail, is ready to die of tedium and confusion, which I hope is not where we are now, but uh, ready to die of tedium and confusion. Uh, Franco Moretti argues that maps are a good way to prepare a text for analysis. You reduce the text to a few elements and abstract them from the narrative flow and construct a new artificial object that will possess emerging qualities which were not visible at the lower level. But I think, so first of all, this is actually important if we think about humanities, which is to say a map is not truth, right? It's a model. A map is a model that helps us understand in a different way. Um, Moretti is talking about maps that illustrate narratives. So he does a lot with mapping the places that characters within a novel visit, for instance. Um, but I'm talking about how isolating units of spatial data can help us understand the journeys of text themselves, their sites of reprinting, their potential readers, their means of distribution, and then compare them with other textual histories. So uh, let me show you what this looks like in practice. So the, the Newberry Library uh, ha publishes an atlas of historical county boundaries, right? The, the shape of the nation has changed quite a bit over the years. And using this data, you can get at what the counties in the United States look like at uh, all these points back through history, right? There's also some wonderful da data on the railroads and making of modern America site about uh, precisely where railroad stations have appeared and disappeared uh, in the past uh, 150 years or so. 
So if we bring that data together, the historical county boundaries, with a print history, and these dots here represent the history of one story that's been reprinted, we can start to see some correlations, for instance, between transportation networks and the way that printing, uh, printed stories spread around the country. I actually first noticed this when I geo-rectified this historical map. This is um, Tanner's Traveler's Map of the United States, and it was a map specifically for people who wanted to navigate the country uh, via rail or road. Uh, and when you geo-rectify, you can take a historical map and you bring it into a GIS program and you can align the historical map with the modern spatial coordinates so that it kind of snaps to the, the globe. And I, I had some data on print history and I had this historical map and I geo-rectified the map and it snapped into place and the first thing that I saw was that the print history seemed to be laying right on top of the railroads, right? And this is maybe not surprising, right? Print follows population, railroads follow population. But it's not something I had ever thought of before, right? It didn't occur to me until I mapped it. The other thing that we can do is we can bring historical census data into play. And there's census data stretching all the way back to the first census that's free to download. You can just grab it and use it. Historical census data is broken down by county. I have historical county boundaries from my other data set. So we can merge those two data sets and we can begin to visualize the country at different points by different uh, census uh, data, right? So here I've taken one print history and I've drawn a, a buffer around it, a 10 mile buffer. I picked that kind of arbitrarily. It seemed reasonable for people without uh, cars, but I could have done five miles, I could have done 20 miles. And my sense here is what I want to do is get a picture of the markets through which a particular story may have circulated, right? So below, uh, the, the map has been filled in with the census data. So then I can merge the print history with the census data below it, and I can begin to make some comparisons, right? How many people lived near this print history versus that print history? Uh, and then there's all, there, there are hundreds of data points. I picked a few uh, just to show here, right? How many public libraries? How many literate people? And we can begin to draw some comparisons about the different markets through which different stories moved. Now, of course, that can't tell us precisely who read the story, right? And there are other problems uh, when we do that. Uh, stories where, or cities where a story may have been printed more than once, like New York or Boston, only get represented one time. I haven't yet developed a model that can account for the circulation of particular newspapers, which is one of my next uh, challenges. But I find this promising for thinking about uh, print histories writ large. I got ahead of my text. <laughs> so, while geographic data can illuminate some aspects of these textual histories, oh wait, now I have to show you this because I'm proud of this. <laughs> I, I was at UCLA this summer at a mapping institute and uh, just as a kind of thought experiment, I, I brought together two data sets. One is the historical county data set that you saw before um, and the other is data from the Library of Congress about where newspapers were founded and in some cases disappeared. And unfortunately, uh, can you see the lines from where you are? It's hard for me to see the lines. I don't know if it's the light. Sort of, sort of, kind of, okay. Well, you'll have to go see this on my website. What I like about this, what I like about this visualization is the way that the newspapers kind of strike out to the territories, the way the, the newspapers precede political boundaries. Um, you can see like the, the little orange dots will appear sort of out in, well, we know it wasn't empty, right? But it what appears empty, it's politically empty. Um, and then they will quickly be bounded uh, by, by county boundaries uh, within a few seconds. Uh, I, I find it evocative. I, I don't really have an interpretive point to make about it, but I was really proud to have made it and wanted to show it off. So there you go. So uh, geographic data can illuminate some aspects of these textual histories, but perhaps more exciting to me right now is the promise that viral texts hold for untangling and modeling networks of influence among 19th century newspapers and periodicals. Uh, viral texts point directly to influence. One newspaper thought that a text from another newspaper was worthy enough or worthy enough of scorn to reprint it, right? And it tells us something about where they were getting their other newspapers, right? Because they had to have found them somewhere. 19th century texts moved through these intermeshed networks of authors and readers and editors, which were often not tied to local geography. Uh, 
Instead, connections were often formed through common denominational or political affiliation, personal acquaintanceships between editors and writers, or the communications infrastructure determined by the roads, the postal routes, and the railway lines. In the postal age, David Henkins contends that the post and the rail fostered, quote, new expectations of contact and feelings of proximity, connecting physically separated parties within a shared temporal framework. For Henkins, those expectations and feelings are most, they're the most important outcome of the new technological systems. And if we think of reprinted texts as strong indicators of connections between different publications, then a vast index of reprinted texts, such as we've uncovered, can be used to visualize those connections directly without the intermediary of a map. So to describe this briefly, you may have seen a network graph before, right? A network graph is there to illustrate connections among people, in this case, among publications. Each of those circles is a newspaper from the, the mined collection of newspapers that we've been working with. The lines between them indicate a shared reprint. So if two newspapers shared one reprint, then there's a very thin line between them. The thicker the line between them, the more reprints they shared. And we can extrapolate from there, or at least theorize, that the closer the connection between them. Uh, the other thing, I'm using a software package called Gephi. The other thing that Gephi can do is try and automatically detect communities. So communities of frequent, in this case, textual sharing, and to visualize those by color. And what you begin to see are, are sort of clusters of newspapers that were closely connected. They were often printing the same things, and then we could infer that there was some connection between them. And, and I'll talk in a minute about what we've been doing with that, the way we use the kind of model to begin to dig in and figure out what these connections were, right, that the data is pointing out. One reason among many that I'm so glad to be at Northeastern is that Northeastern has a real strength in network science. And I've been able to benefit from colleagues in computer sciences, health sciences, political science, and other fields uh, who have helped me realize that these models, say, of modern political exchange uh, can, and even epidemiology, pertain also to these historical textual networks. And one of the oddest moments of my career thus far, I was in a room sort of showing my data about 19th century newspaper exchange, and in the room was a physicist, and a political scientist, and a computer scientist, and none of them cared at all about 19th century newspapers, but they all thought the model was really interesting and were giving me suggestions about how the model could be perfected to uh, better represent the connections that I was finding in the data, right? That was a really uh, exciting meeting for me. Okay. So here you can see the, the, the kinds of connections that I'm talking about. Oh, also, the circle size uh, illustrates how central a particular newspaper was to the network. Uh, one of the things that's been most exciting to me about this is that it actually, it points out the relative centrality of newspapers that I, I just don't think would be on our radar otherwise, right? There are these newspapers, like you see up there, the Vermont Phoenix in Brattleboro, Vermont, actually was sending out an awful lot of texts that were getting reprinted by other newspapers. Um, there's one right on the corner, you can't see it too well, to my chagrin, because it's my favorite. It's the Boonslick Times in Missouri. And the Boonslick Times was quite central to the reprinting that was going on during the period. And I, I like it because it's called the Boonslick Times. But um, we we've been digging in to figure out why, why is this newspaper so central? And it turns out that the Boonslick Times is on a bend in the Mississippi River that almost everyone had to pass by if they were traveling up or down the Mississippi River. And so they became this kind of center of exchange of newspapers and periodicals, right? But I wouldn't have known that had the data not sort of pointed to how central that publication was. When we compare not two print histories, but thousands, we can really begin to understand how the network of 19th century print culture operated. We can ask, for instance, which publications most shaped the network by analyzing whose texts were most likely to be reprinted elsewhere. What were the central publications that shaped antebellum readers and thus helped shape antebellum taste and opinion? So I want to end with some work that's very, very, very nascent. And talk about some of the new questions that are emerging from our early findings in the reprinting project. Perhaps most compelling to me right now is a question of genre. A significant pr percentage of the most frequently reprinted texts are similar to these three examples, which I'm going to show you here. This is Tom Snoop's. It's a really short, maybe five paragraph uh, story about a husband who decides that his wife is uh, sort of walking all over him and he's not going to take it anymore. And so he decides that he's not going to churn the butter for her anymore. And he puts his foot down 
and uh, gets punished for it. And it's a joke. It ends, it's, it's a joke about this silly guy who uh, tried to pull one over on his wife and he's never going to do it again at the end. I'm, I'm not going to, you know, you can't explain a joke. Whatever. Uh, in any case, that's what it is. This little short thing. It's not even a short story. It's, it's a little, uh, little anecdote of, of a married life. A similar one that we can find in these two newspapers called A Wife Worth Having, you'll note that a lot of these center on domestic issues, uh, is, is a temperance story. It's a story about a man who's drinking too much, it's causing destruction in his family, his wife pleads for him to stop and he takes the temperance pledge and he cleans up his life. Again, it's five or six paragraphs, really short text. Then there's this one, a gem, the dying wife to her husband, the following most touching fragment of a letter from a dying wife to her husband was found to him some months after her death between the leaves of a religious volume which she was very fond of perusing. And this is just her admonishment to him to live you know, a good life now that she's departed the world. Again, short little text. I've been debating what to call these, anecdotes, episodes, vignettes. Um, French scholars have this term fait divers, which they use for similar texts. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe has this word bizarreries, which I wish I could use, but it doesn't quite fit, but I love the word. Um, intensities is another possibility. If we were feeling dismissive, we might just call them filler. No doubt that was their functional purpose much of the time. An editor had three column inches he needed to fill. Let's grab this. It's about three inches, right? But I'm so fascinated by this genre. This is a, a lovely poem about this process of copying, copying and pasting from one newspaper to the other. I'm fascinated by this genre because I think it actually exposes something really essential about the period that we really haven't grappled with as scholars yet. Uh, this is a, a letter from Edgar Allan Poe to Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And, and actually, I just added this to the presentation today. I was in the Boston Public Library looking through Edgar Allan Poe's letters and came across this, and it seemed perfectly apropos. Um, I need not call your attention to the signs of the times in respect to magazine literature. You will admit that the tendency of the age lies in this way, so far at least as regards the higher letters. The brief, the terse, the condensed, and the easily circulated will take place of the diffuse, the ponderous, and the inaccessible. Even our reviews are found too massive for the tastes of the day. If you didn't know that was Poe, you'd think he was talking about Twitter or something, right? I'm fascinated by this genre because these vignettes seem of a piece with the 19th century newspaper. Uh, as I said, the 19th century newspaper was this hybrid publication that included fiction, it included poetry, it included news stories, it included political opinions, geographic descriptions of foreign places. And if you notice, these stories seem to participate in that hybrid nature, right? They purport to be true, or maybe truthy, if we were going to borrow from Stephen Colbert. Um, the following most touching fragment was found by him some months after her death in the leaves of a religious volume. Like these specific details that imply a, a news story, right? But there's no details about what their name was or where they were. Or n nothing one could follow up on if you wanted to check the veracity of the story, right? They seem to be operating in this gray area between fiction and nonfiction that is enabled by the form of 19th century periodicals. For many reasons, these kind of texts fall well outside the usual purview of 19th century literary scholars. If indeed these vignettes prove to be central to 19th century newspaper and periodical culture, however, then they demand closer study. The affordances of large-scale text mining make identifying the most important vignettes from the period possible, perhaps for the first time. So just briefly, our, our, our next steps. We're looking into more collections. So far, we've only looked at the Library of Congress's collection. It looks like we're about to get access to a lot more. Um, we've got the Making of America uh, magazines and journals. We've got all that data now ready to be analyzed. We're looking into the Write American Fiction collection. Uh, American Memory is on its way. And we've begun to negotiate with some commercial archives, although that's stickier in every way, because there are these huge, uh, Redex has uh, America's Historical Newspapers, which is this huge index of historical newspapers. Uh, ProQuest has American Periodical Series Online. If we can get some of that data, we can really flesh this out. And, and I, I'm hopeful, actually, that we're going to get much of it. Uh, this is what the, um, 
Making of America collection data looks like. We've, it's on my computer ready to, be, ready to be analyzed. Some of the big questions that we're wanting to look at are how do particular changes to particular laws reshape these networks at different times in the 19th century? We want to look at pre and post telegraph. How did new communications technologies change the practices of reprinting? How did various social, political, or religious factors shape habits of reprinting or reauthorship? The big one we want to get at is can we actually pin down what textual features contributed to textual virality at different moments, right? What are some of the things that made a text more likely to go viral? Um, it wasn't puppies in the 19th century, so what was it? Um, how did the priorities of editors and readers change over time? So one of the things we did, we're doing right now, I have some grad assistants who are doing some uh, basic annotation of the newspaper data, right? Trying to break it down by political affiliation, religious affiliation, so that we can slice the data in different ways, right? Does the Baptist reprinting look different from the democratic reprinting? Does religious or secular reprinting look different? Uh, do they cross? How often do they cross? Are there particular newspapers that are likely to bring a story from the religious press to the secular press or vice versa? That sort of thing. And some of the stuff that they've been uncovering is just really wonderful. I, I won't go into too much detail, but Abby Mullen, who's one of my students, has just been digging in and finding these incredibly interesting connections. So whenever she's looking at these places where there are really strong connections between newspapers and then trying to figure out why, why is there such a strong connection? So one of the most interesting ones for me is the, the Fremont Journal, which is closely connected with the, uh, with the Vermont Phoenix in Brattleboro, Vermont. And she's basically uncovered that uh, there's a, a marriage uh, that the, the two editors of the newspaper were brothers-in-law and that this is probably why there was a lot of sharing between these two newspapers. So early insights, which are, which are necessarily pretty broad at the moment, but the viral texts reflect broad cultural values. And so one thing that I am finding is there are not a lot of politically um, sensitive articles that are widely shared, right? Those, Domestic stories that are pretty general, not likely to incite an awful lot of anger on any side of an issue, those de do seem to be the most frequently reprinted kinds of texts, so general interest. They're pithy and portable, both materially and ideologically. So you have a story like the Celestial Railroad that can be reappropriated by different groups to say different things, right? It's portable. Um, they participated in and propagated wider literary trends. So we know that temperance literature was very popular and there are an awful lot of temperance stories in our index. We know that sentimentalism was a popular mode and there are a lot of sentimental stories in our index. And they exemplified and exploited the hybridity of antebellum newspapers as I've talked about already. So our most ambitious aim for this reprint discovery project is to develop a model or a set of models to describe 19th century virality. By addressing these texts at many levels and with a range of tools, we will study what features assisted or impeded texts going viral. Using topic modeling to sketch out the typical features of sentimental fiction, for instance, we might track those features within our set of texts to see to what extent does a text's sentimentality uh, affect whether or not it was reprinted. And we can ask what political, cultural, or social factors shaped a text's reception within the larger networks or smaller communities. So I'm particularly interested in knowing whether religious texts circulated differently from secular texts, for instance. So by way of closing, I want to evoke again Nathaniel Hawthorne's complaint about the pamphlet and piratical system that he saw breaking up all regular literature. Sorry, that was my promotion for the new lab. This is where we're doing all this stuff uh, at Northeastern. Um, literary scholars, even those who have so usefully challenged the makeup of the literary canon, have long focused on regular literature, in part because our tools of study haven't given us adequate purchase from which to examine larger systems through, alongside, or against which literary production operated. New approaches such as geospatial or network analysis may offer such purchase. Such research can complement close study of text and help scholars grapple with the big, sometimes unwieldy history of the antebellum print market, which was for its time as expansive, unchecked, unruly, and culturally disruptive as the internet is today. Thanks.
So I'm, I'm happy to take questions if anyone has them. Well, there are two things that actually happen uh, sort of in tandem as the, uh, in the late 19th century, which is that copyright law begins to become more restrictive. And it's not, it's not really one moment. There's a series of things that change, a series of laws that are passed that, that change. Um, there's also the, the growing professionalization of journalism as a field. Um, you know, in the, before 1860, you couldn't go to school and get a journalism degree, right? Um, but as journalism becomes uh, codified as a field, then a lot of these practices begin to fade. Um, so I, I don't, there's not a particular date. It changes. Uh, the wire service changes things dramatically because what you then get are sort of authorized systems of reprinting, uh, where it's not this kind of organic sharing from one paper to the other, but it's you know eventually the AP publishes a story and distributes it rapidly you know around the country, and then that story gets reprinted. But that's um, that's okay, right? It's they're they're buying into that system, um, and so it's it's technological, it's social, it's the profession. A lot of things change, but this really begins to fade out, uh, you know, in the late nineteenth century. Oh, I, so I should clarify, he's not bemoaning. Poe isn't. He's saying we've got to recognize this and we've got to, because he, he's, he's trying to get Longfellow to uh, help him publish this new magazine that he wants to publish. And My question is, like, do we find uh, sort of arguments about or sort of more sort of larger debates about originality or, or reusing the question about what constitutes originality? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's, this, is, this is a debate that lots and lots of authors are having. And one reason I find Poe so fascinating is that he talks out of both sides of his mouth, right? Poe complains vociferously about people plagiarizing his work or the, the sort of rampant plagiarism going on. At the same time, Poe plagiarizes pretty rampantly. Um, he complains about the system of reprinting uh, in many of the same ways that Hawthorne does, right? That, that authors aren't being compensated, but that their work is being distributed. But if he wanted a story of his to get popular, he would anonymously send it to lots of newspapers in hopes that they would reprint it, right? Uh, so he, he seems to be, <laughs> he seems to be both working the system and sort of complaining about the system at the same time. Um, you know, it varies pretty widely. Uh, a really popular author during the period was named uh, Fanny Fern. Fanny Fern was a, uh, she wrote for newspapers and magazines. Uh, she wrote a novel called Ruth Hall um, and was, by some accounts, the most highly paid writer of the, in the period, in the 19th century. Um, really popular kind of columnist. I think we, we would call her a columnist today. She wrote these short columns. Um, in Ruth Hall, her magazine, or her, her novel, uh, the central character is, is a writer uh, who's trying to get popular. And there's a moment where actually she gets really excited because she's heard that newspapers have started reprinting one of her stories. This was a sign that you'd sort of made it, right? That people were paying attention to your, to your writing. So what you find in the period are really complicated discussions where authors both want their work to get reprinted, but they also complain because they're not getting paid for those reprintings. And some writers kind of embrace the system and some don't. And actually for me, it's pretty analogous to our current moment where you have some bands, for instance, who have figured out how to promote themselves online, right? Give away their music and then get people to come to their concerts, right? And then you have other bands like, say, Metallica, who are sort of fighting as hard as they can against people pirating their music, right? And so it's this moment where this new technology is very disruptive. And some people are able to kind of use that disruption to their benefit and others uh, sort of rail against it, right? It is. Yeah. Yeah. So at the moment, New Lab is people. <laughs> it's people. Um, 
it's, it's myself, it's David Smith. We were both hired under a digital humanities search uh, last year. Um, it's Elizabeth Dillon and David Lazare who were are already there and had this idea for an interdisciplinary center. It brings together both digital humanities and computational social science. So we're not just a digital humanities center. Um, we've been forming some partnerships with the library. We're supposed to actually have a physical uh, shared office space next year, starting in the fall. Um, and we have some hires that are ongoing right now that are going to bulk up the, the new lab faculty. Um, along with that, we've started tossing around the idea for a professional master's in digital humanities and, and archival work uh, that will probably be part of what the new lab is up to soon enough. Um, at the moment, though, it's, it's very nascent. Right? We're, 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 this has been very much a planning year. We've started to host symposia. We've had talks. We've had the, the events at, at MLA. Um, we're hoping to do more of that next year. Um, but I, I'm pretty excited about where it's going. We've got a really dynamic group of researchers there who are interested broadly in, in w the, the subtitle for text maps and networks is, is deliberate because the people we're gathering are all people who are doing either spatial work or network uh, work uh, tied to textual analysis. So we're, we're really not going for the digital humanities in a really broad sense. We're really trying to cultivate an expertise in a particular kind of digital humanities. Yeah. So, I mean, we're using lab in the, in the sort of research working group sense, right? Um, we will have physical space. My sense is it'll be more shared office space with probably a you know, presentation uh, area for people who are coming to give talks and things of that nature. Uh, you know, I didn't add, we also have uh, grad fellows. That started actually in the spring. It's brand new. But we have six graduate fellows in English and history who are helping with new lab projects. We've got about three projects that we're working on right now that grow directly out of the founding members' uh, research agendas, but we're, we're hoping to add more. Um, we have talked about different ways of involving the, the wider DH community in Boston. Uh, whether that will be physical space or whether that will be just sponsoring more kinds of workshops and symposia. You know, we've got the, uh, if you haven't signed up yet, uh, in uh, just a few weeks here, uh, the 18th and 19th of March, we have Boston Area Days of DH. We're going to have people from around the around Boston talking about their research. We're going to have people uh, running workshops on different kinds of methodologies tied to text maps and networks. Um, you'll notice if you look at the workshops on offer that they're all either about text maps or networks. We're doing that deliberately. And then we're going to cap it all off with a, the NEH is going to be running a grants workshop for people to, uh, who are interested in learning how to write a grant for the NEH's Office of Digital Humanities. Um, so there's that kind of programming. I, I don't know what the, I've actually tossed around the idea of kind of a public, uh, I don't know, creative space, but I'm not sure whether that will come to fruition or not.
Yeah. Well, you open up a whole thing when you talk about Uncle Tom's Cabin. The, the, uh, the first digital humanities project I ever worked on was the Uncle Tom's Cabin archive at the University of Virginia. So uh, I could talk for a long time about that particular cultural artifact. Um, so w with, you know, the, the text I know the most is the one I started with, with which is the Hawthorne story. And, and I actually am pretty firmly convinced after all this research that Hawthorne's later reputation perhaps doesn't exist without the Celestial Railroad which is to say we tend to think of his early short story career, uh, we think of him as a kind of struggling short story writer who uh, was, you know, couldn't really even support his family all the time and uh, was um, regionally known but not nationally known. And one thing we find with that story is that it, it was very national, right? It made it all the way to Wisconsin, which was a territory at the time. Um, and was, was widely cited even in the South, where Hawthorne was not generally uh, well known. Um, so, or we didn't think Hawthorne was well known, I guess is what I want to say. Um, and there, there's some interesting uh, examples. Uh, so there's a, there's a, a review of the Scarlet Letter uh, that I found in a, a church magazine right after the Scarlet Letter comes out. And what the review basically boils down to is, you remember that guy who wrote the Celestial Railroad? He has a book out, <laughs> right? Uh, because that's what they assumed the readers would know Hawthorne for, and uh, that's what they gravitated to. So th there, is, there is a part of me that actually wonders whether Hawthorne's later reputation is possible without his kind of viral career earlier on. It's hard to prove that, right? We can point to different pieces of evidence, but it's hard to prove that. As far as the data that we've been uncovering, I mean, I was, show I was showing you really like bleeding edge stuff. Like th that index of reprinted text is a few months old, <laughs> right? We're just beginning to really dig into it. One striking feature about the most reprinted things is that many of them are anonymous, right? A lot of them are anonymous. And so trying to draw any causal connection between those stories and the career of a particular author might be difficult unless we find some, some magical thing that tells us who the author is, which we might. I mean, we might find one attributed version that we could use to establish the rest. Um, but thinking about the, the Uncle Tom's Cabin example, for instance, I, I've been thinking a lot about how this work informs our understanding of, of other things, of, of novels such as Uncle Tom's Cabin. Or I have another project I'm working on with uh, Jerome McGann around the work of James Fenimore Cooper. And I'm increasingly thinking of the text uh, not as this kind of firmly established object, but as a, as a kind of social network, right? The text is, it propagates other texts, right? It references them, it reprints them, it quotes from them. Uh, something like Uncle Tom's Cabin, and, and actually this, this goes back to my very first article, which I wrote before I was ever even thinking about this viral stuff. The very first article I ever wrote was about how Uncle Tom's Cabin reappropriates temperance imagery in its appeal against slavery, right? And how Uncle Tom, the character, actually assumes the role of the temperance wife falling to her knees and begging her husband to reform, except in this case he's falling to his knees and begging his master to reform, right? This project has me thinking about Uncle Tom's Cabin as, as, as propagating, propagating a lot of the same signals that these really short pieces were propagating, right? A lot of them tap into temperance narratives. And what's interesting is because they're only five paragraphs long, they can't give you all the details of the temperance narrative. They can't walk through it the way that a longer pamphlet would. But because the temperance narrative is so culturally resonant and people know it so well, it can kind of do it, perform a shorthand of the temperance narrative that just sort of throws out a few references, assuming that readers can kind of fill it in, right? That readers know what all this means. Um, and so if we think of the temperance narrative, uh, this is a highly charged word, but it's like a meme, right? The temperance narrative is a meme. Uncle Tom's Cabin is sort of propagating that meme uh, to reappropriating it to argue against slavery. These texts are kind of reappropriating it to get popular and to sort of, you know, help uh, to entice the readers of the newspapers and magazines. Um, so thinking about text as kind of social systems, right, or, or signals of social systems, I think is actually helpful for thinking about larger works too. I'm not sure if I answered your question or just sort of went in another direction, but it, it was a good question. Mm 
Yes. Uh, so that brings up a couple of things. One, one uh, there's a really provocative argument, which I wish was mine, is not, uh, that that large-scale system, uh, you're right, so readership is uh, dramatically increased. Uh, print technology gets faster and also way cheaper, which enables really small groups to suddenly have publications, right? So in every town, you can have not a newspaper, but a Republican newspaper and a Democratic newspaper and maybe a Baptist newspaper and a Methodist newspaper, right? Um, and so you have the, an explosion of denominational periodicals, of political periodicals, um, but there's a really provocative argument that says without this system of reprinting, you don't actually have the human capital to support so many newspapers which is to say not every little tiny town could actually hire writers and editors uh, that could fill the columns of that newspaper every single day. But by having this distributed system of labor where everyone's borrowing and sharing from one another, you can actually support all of those little tiny publications all around the country, right? And you can have, you can have national news and international news without uh, having to pay national or international reporters, right? And so the system of reprinting is its own technology that's, I think, as essential to what you're talking about as the, as the presses are and as the literacy is. But all of these things are intermeshed. I mean, that's one of the things that's most exciting to me about this work, is trying to get some kind of leverage for understanding the system as opposed to just looking at this or that text that we're moving around in the system. <laughs> Forever. <laughs> um, yeah, not, not that long, actually. I mean, that's, that's maybe the most exciting part about this. I mean, I, I've been working on the Hawthorne story for a couple of years. Um, you know, you know what the cycle, you probably know what the cycles of publishing in the humanities look like. I started putting that article together, you know, three or four years ago, and it's now coming out, right? Um, the larger work, the larger work thinking about viral textuality at scale is, you know, maybe, maybe a year old, right? I mean, I, I really was starting to think about the affordances for this kind of work as I was thinking about moving to Northeastern. Shortly after I got the offer at Northeastern, they put me in touch with David Smith, who had also gotten an offer, and we started collaborating uh, before we got here. Um, so this is really very nascent. Um, I expect in some sense that we'll be working on this for a while yet because there's a lot of iterations that we want to, to test. Right? We wanna, there are certain key dates and we want to sort of compare before and after those dates to see how this changes. We want to start to do those more fine-grained analyses based on religion, politics, these sorts of qualities. Um, you know, so I, you know, I, I hope it'll be done in time for me to you know, publish something for tenure. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, that's the goal. A uh, couple more years. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks.